Today's gospel about forgiveness um, is important, but it's also important in another dimension because what we profess morally also has, um, that's a fancy term, but metaphysical meaning as well. So one of the things that the Protestant Reformation did to the Western world, and it's not a good one, but it's understandable, is that it separated the moral and the natural. So we no longer have what some philosophers call as an enchanted view of the universe, where there's an interconnection between the laws of the world, the laws of God, natural law, and divine law, that there's this kind of circumincessio of those different kind of rules. Now, one of the ways in which that kind of broken up is that today, very few of us believe that there is a correlation or a connection between how one acts morally and how the world works. You notice that? Very rarely do people just intuitively think that bad actions result in plagues and all this other stuff. Now, but here's the thing. <laughs> it still happens. How many of you have a friend that is going around and saying, oh, this, this thing that's going on must be some kind of judgment from above. It's like, okay, not quite. Christianity nuanced it a fair bit. Judaism nuanced it a fair bit. There is a moral correlation with what we do, but we can't figure out what it is. That is what the Christian revolution has done for the world. And so in the ancient world, um, very often, if some plague happened or some calamity happened, the first thought was, we angered a god. Then the next thought was, which one? And third is, how? And the sad thing when you live in a universe run by capricious gods is that it's next to impossible to figure out which god is upset with you. <laughs> next to impossible. And then the last part is, is you don't know why he's upset. This, this can be like an unreasonable parent or an unreasonable boss at work. And you try to figure, it's like, what will make him happy? What will, you know, what will get him off our case? And one of those beautiful things about reading Homer is you realize is that sometimes there's nothing you can do to placate that God. He either hates you or she, <laughs> or she thinks so little of you that your suffering has zero meaning to them. Just in the same way that when the Trojans and the Greeks were fighting on the plains of Troy, just outside, the gods were using that war as an opportunity to air their grievances with each other. I'm sure you st heard the story about the golden apple of discord. You know the story? Then I'll tell you the story. <laughs> it's what prompted the Trojan War. Um, the three goddesses of primary note, Aphrodite, Hera, and Athena, got into a beauty contest. <laughs> what I love about the Greeks is how they could just readily admit that their gods are no better than us. <laughs> so they, they get into a beauty contest. Which one of us is the most beautiful? Um, then, after having gone through that, then they decide, well, we'll have a guy figure out which, we'll get a mortal to pick which one of us is the most beautiful. So they pick Paris, who's the son of Priam and Troy. And so he's told, you're going to pick which one of us is the most beautiful. Now, Paris is an idiot, just for the record. Um, a smart man would say, I ain't touching that at all. <laughs> but Paris is like, OK, I'll do it. Um, and you get it. For, and this doesn't happen in the Iliad, by the way. This is the conceptual background of the Greek world. But you see throughout the Iliad that Paris is just a loser. Um, his name is also Alexandros. And so Paris is just like, okay, I'll make this decision. And then the goddesses, then they start bribing them, bribing him with their wares, you know. Athena promises him all those sorts of things. Um, Athena is the goddess of war and wisdom. There's a joke about the Greek gods, too, because they're all gods of war somehow. Ares is the god of war, but of rage and wrath. Athena is the god of, goddess of war, but she's much smarter and tougher than her pathetic brother, Ares. Um, and then there's Hera, who's the goddess um, of the house and the home, and she's the wife of Zeus. And so she um, offers Paris all of her different wiles and wares. And Aphrodite goes up to him, and she's the goddess of love, and she says, I'll give you the heart of the most beautiful woman in the world. 
And he's like, sold. <laughs> so he then, um, and this is where it gets really ambiguous. Um, he is rewarded with Helen of Troy, who's known to be the most beautiful woman in the world. And she, um, well, she's called Helen of Troy because he takes her away. She was actually married to Menelaus of Sparta. And so he whisks her off in the middle of the night. And what's important about the ancient documents is that it's unknown if he coerced her or they fell in love. And what I find is very interesting about it is that both can be true. Both can be true. Um, if a person has the capacity of manipulating the emotions and thoughts of somebody or the affections of someone, um, they might come willingly, but they're still slaves. It can be the same way in which a man or a woman can emotionally manipulate someone either through physical or sexual attraction and just enslave them. So she gets dragged off to Troy and she hates her life. She hates it. Um, let's just say that some of the most vicious and horrible words said about her are by herself. But her tragedy is not my point. My point is, these three goddesses now hate each other. But they don't fight each other, because you can't fight a god. So they have their people fight each other. Hera now hates the Trojans. Athena hates the Trojans. And Aphrodite loves the Trojans. And so they become a proxy war for the gods that refuse to forgive each other. Hera engages um, in her interesting little plots where after Zeus makes a big decree that none of the gods will fight in this war, then she seduces her husband to distract his gaze so that they can slaughter more Trojans. Um, Aphrodite um, whisks away Paris after he, the one courageous thing he does in his life, the one courageous thing he does in his life is that he says, all of these guys are dying for me. Maybe I should fight my enemy alone in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Menelaus and I should fight. And everyone's like, and everyone on both sides of the war is like, dude, yeah, you should have done that a long time ago. We hate you. So he's about to die, and everyone's like, let him die. <laughs> they all hate Paris. It's like, let him die. And then Aphrodite whisks him away, and then the war continues. Now, I'm giving you this lesson in the Greek classics to point out to you that this is the normal view of the world. That you placate gods who are capricious and cruel and care nothing about you and then sometimes will accept your offerings and then spit on your face. So how do we worship the true God? Mercy. And this is the really funny part. Mercy is always, even in this world of the Greeks that I've been giving you, mercy is always the prerogative of the king. Um, if you show clemency to anyone without having the king's permission, you're dead. <laughs> um, it's the way in which the king shows his grandeur. It's like, and it happens a lot throughout history. Uh, Julius Caesar um, tries to gain power in what would become the Roman Empire by showing clemency to all the people who rebelled against him. What happens to Julius Caesar? They kill him. And so you see the conundrum of the human condition. We don't show mercy, not because we haven't thought of it before. Jesus didn't reveal mercy to the world. He gave us the means by which it is possible. Why don't you show mercy? We're afraid of death. It's as plain as simple as that. We're afraid of losing everything that we've worked so hard to achieve. And by the way, the people you have a hard time forgiving, why do you have a hard time forgiving them? It's because they harm the thing that represents you the most. They've killed 
you. And that's why Jesus warns us in a concomitant passage, do not fear those who can kill the body, but those who can kill body and soul in hell. Now, it gets even more sophisticated, but if all of your desires are according to the flesh, that is why you can't please God. Because there's no offering you can make that will interest him. You'll be like a pagan going up to God and saying, hey, look, all this gold I've brought you. And he'll go, gold. I didn't need you to give me gold. This is the experience of the Jewish people for thousands of years. They're like, God, look at all these great offerings we've brought you. You see how good we are? And God's like, I made it all. It's mine anyway. <laughs> You're not going to treat me like you treat Marduk or Zeus or Hera. There's nothing you can do that's going to make my life fuller. There's one thing I ask of you. Kindness, tenderness. Walk humbly before your God. That's what I'm asking of you. And then we come to the point when we say, but Lord, I can't forgive. Now often we fall into despondency when we hear today's gospel and we hear Jesus say, unless you forgive from your heart, then this will be your fate. Um, what he's basically saying is, is, unless you worship the true God, the fate of the false gods will be yours. And yes, it's hard to forgive from our heart. It's like dying. <laughs> it's like dying. And even when someone's asking for forgiveness, giving it is like dying. I don't know how many times I've had somebody say, try to say I'm sorry to me, and I've just said, not, not yet, go away. I'm not even in a state right now to receive your asking of forgiveness. It's going to happen. Just give me a day. <laughs> Just give me a day. But right now, I can't even receive your petition for forgiveness. I'm not that good of a man. But if we want to be like God, the first step is realizing that you're not yet. It's all a part of the treatment. It's all a part of the growth. Knowing that we're not like God is a first step. Because it's also just as dangerous to create a parody of God as the Greeks did. The Greeks were looking after the divine. And as Chesterton said about the Romans, he said, above all, the Romans believed in reverence, but they had no one to revere. So be very careful when we suppose that our reverence is doing God his due. Be very, very careful about your sense of reverence and due propriety. Because very often it will fall crumbling, crumbling down. Now you might be wondering what any of this has to do with St. Patrick. Only a small, small amount. <laughs> um, but what I find so absolutely touching about St. Patrick um, is that his entire mission was a success because it was done out of mercy. The biggest historical misconception about St. Patrick is that he's Irish. He ain't Irish. Not even close. He was kidnapped by the Irish. Forced into slavery by the Irish and escaped the Irish. <laughs> and then he decided, huh, only a people enslaved in heart and mind enslaves their neighbor. They need to know about Jesus. And he went into Ireland and he failed in his mission because he wanted to get killed for the faith. He, like St. Francis, was bitterly disappointed that he wasn't martyred for the faith. St. <laughs> Francis goes um, to preach among the Muslims 
And he, he goes there. He, Francis wanted to have the Islamic world kill him. And, he, and then they liked him so much to like, hey, you, your, your buddies can take over the shrines in the Holy Land. And he's like, okay, that's good too. <laughs> He's kind of surprised. St. Francis shows up, uh, Shane, uh, Fran, uh, Patrick shows up in Ireland and he's like, I'm going to tell you about Jesus and you're going to kill me. And they're like, kind of sounds pretty good there. <laughs> we like this gospel that you're preaching. Because, and as Chesterton noted about the Romans, they knew in their heart of hearts that although the world is enslaved by the powers of the world, that there's a goodness behind it that has hidden his face. And he's hidden his face precisely because we seeked after idols for so, so long. So that now that the true God has revealed his face through the missionary work of St. Patrick, freedom has been given. We are in a trying time because Canada's idols are falling falling and collapsing and people are falling into despair we have long since convinced ourselves that we can live half of our life in Mexico or half of our life in Arizona and that we can spend all of our money to our heart's content and then after that then we'll be able to live long in a life of security and probably die in a bed surrounded by our loved ones maybe but not likely Besides, that's not a life worth living. Spend your life for the poor. Don't be ridiculous and take unnecessary risks. But sometimes it's worth it to spend it all for the good of others. While I hope it doesn't happen to me, seven priests have already died in Italy. They were men that decided to take the risk, to go inside quarantine zones and minister to those who were sick. And they knew the risk. They knew the danger. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. <laughs>